Visiting Copenhagen in 1731 to attend the coronation of King Christian VI, Nikolaus von Zinzendorf met a converted slave from the West Indies, Anthony Ulrich. The man was looking for someone to go back to his homeland to preach the gospel to black slaves, including his sister and brother. Zinzendorf raced back to the Hörnhut to find men to go. Two immediately volunteered, becoming the first Moravian missionaries and the first Protestant missionaries of the modern era. Now, a new mission is brewing. Wachovia. 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 The king has now divided Carolina into three provinces, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, and my Lord Granville's district belongs to North Carolina. Georgia was not kind to us. Our ways are not their ways. Our women speak for themselves. We've lived among the slaves of the Caribbean. And find that they have souls that must be won unto the Lord. And the Cherokee is much the same, and once civilized should be integrated into our midst. Pennsylvania is to our liking, but there's no room for us there for great expansion. North Carolina is a rather large province, and the condition of the inhabitants varies so greatly that often what's good for the southern part is bad for the northern, and vice versa which leads to continual strife between the two sections. There is only one governor, one council, one assembly, one set of laws for the whole province, and that makes endless difficulties. And if we settle here, I do not know what we will do unless some convenient remedy can be found. If my Lord Granville's district should become a separate government, there is danger that it could not support itself, for it is still young, and who except the inhabitants will pay the salaries of the governor secretary, and other officers. Perhaps it could be arranged as in Pennsylvania. In North Carolina, there is much to be done for the Lord among the Indians. In and around North Carolina, the Cherokee is a great nation. I cannot ascertain definitely whether there is peace or war between them and the Six Nations. The Tuscaroras say the Cherokee have made peace with the Five Nations. The Cherokees would say the same. I asked one whether the Five Nations were their brothers and he crooked two fingers, linking them together like a chain. The Cherokees are in league with South Carolina and once each year go to Charleston to receive their presents. The Tuscaroras, who live on the Roanoke, they have a tract of good land secured to them by act of assembly. They have no king, but a captain elected from among them by the whites. There are also several chiefs among them. The Tuscaroras are few in number, and they hold with the Six Nations against the Catawbas, suffer much on this account. They live in great poverty and are oppressed by the whites. We have been offered land in Virginia toward the west, some 400,000 acres of land, beautiful land, in which we could have secured a royal grant, free of quit rents. It was said, in Virginia there are navigable rivers, which you will not find in North Carolina, upon which we pondered in silence and remembered. But does not the French lay claim to the above-mentioned land? In North Carolina, we will have to pay poll tax. It is required from all white men, masters or servants, from 16 to 60 years of age. This task must be paid on all Negroes, male and female, from their 12th year. If a man marry a Negress, Indian or mulatto, or anyone of mixed blood, his children to the fourth generation must pay the tax from the 12th year on, and the Indian or mulatto wife is also taxable. It is collected by the sheriff, and if anyone does not pay it, the sheriff must seize a sufficient amount of property, sell it at auction, take out his fees for the sale and the poll tax, and return the balance. The inhabitants of North Carolina are of two kinds. Some have been born in the country, and they bear the climate well but are lazy. They do not compare with our northern colonists. Many of the first comers were bought by poverty, for they were too poor to buy land in Pennsylvania or Jersey, and yet wished to have land of their own. From these, the colony receives no harm. Others, however, were refugees from debt, or had deserted wives and children, or had fled to escape punishment for evil deeds, and thought that here no one would find them and they could go on in impunity. Also, whole bands of horse thieves have moved here and constantly show their skills. 
This has given North Carolina a very bad name in the adjoining provinces. Whereas the late Earl of Granville, deceased, did by deed bearing date August the 7th, 1753, convey unto James Hutton, secretary of the Unitas Fratrum, a large tract of land in North Carolina known by the name of Wachovia. Praise the Lord God. Praise the Lord God. Praise the Lord God. It seems that if we are to become incorporated in North Carolina, it will have to be by act of assembly approved by the king. After traveling across the state, I am told that a different type of settler is now coming in from Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Jersey, and even New England. In this year alone, more than 400 families have come with horse and wagon and cattle. Among them are sturdy farmers and skilled men, and we can hope that they will greatly help Carolina. I praise God with sincere thanks that our father has permitted these his servants to arrange for the purchase of the whole district of Wachovia from Lord Granville. A letter has at last arrived in the year of 1767, granting us permission to pursue the proprietary rights to the 100,000 acre tract of land known as Wachovia. 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 Where? Where? Where is this land? Wachovia, where is this land? Where is this love? Where is this hope? Where is this peace? While the Spanish had softened its position on indigenous slavery due to the trials of de Casa, it continues to persist in our society. Indian slavery never went away, but rather coexisted with African slavery. The five tribes, whose original homeland was located in the southern interior, in an area bounded by the Cumberland River to the north and the Mississippi Valley to the west, and who included the Cherokee, adopted racialized chattel slavery in the late 18th century. Southern whites urged them to participate in the enslaving of black people as a part of the Indian civilization effort. Wachovia. 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 Why? Why am I called to do God's work? Why am I anxious? Wachovia. Wachovia. Searching the land to build a strong family. Wachovia. The Southern Indians at Augusta. Eight or nine different Indian nations were represented, and all anew promised peace with the English. Wachovia. Wachovia. Why am I here? Searching. Searching the land for a place to be. I am following where God leads. Searching the land for a place to call my own. Congress has successfully met with the Southern Indians at Augusta. Searching the land to build a strong family. Welcome to Salem. Am I following where God leads? Welcome to Salem. Welcome to our community. Sarah, Sarah? Mom. Sarah. Questions. Sarah. Searching. Sarah. Love. Baby girl. Sarah? Oh. Hey, Dad. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Ooh, you were gone, girl. Talking and everything. <laughs> I fell asleep. Mm. Mm. Had a very weird dream. That means you're not sleeping well. Happens every time I leave. No, I was waiting on you and I must have just zoned out. Yeah. I've been working hard on an assignment at, at school and it's kind of getting in my head. Wow, it sounds intense. You want to share? Not yet. How was your meeting? Same old, same old. I'm just sorry I was late for our scheduled Zoom chat today. You know, thank you so much for, you know, at least texting me because at least it gave me an excuse or a reason to to, to excuse myself and end my part of the meeting early. <laughs> it was getting late here, so I didn't know what else to do. Yeah. Uh, Dia's going to bed already. I really needed to talk to you before it got too late. Okay. I have an early day tomorrow. I know, you did the right thing. We were just <laughs> going over the same numbers over and over again. They'll be okay. So, so how was your day? Well, okay. I got three more letters. Oh, good. Which schools? Georgetown, Harvard, Howard. Okay, okay. That makes 15 so far. 
I will have to be strategic, but ultimately it's on you, baby girl, your life, your career. You say that now, but you know how you are. What? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you are just like your mother. She would be so proud of you right now. Mm. Show Miss that one. I know, Dad. We haven't spoken since you posted that birthday tribute for her on Facebook Wednesday. Yeah. I wanted to say something, but I miss her too. <laughs> she would have been dancing around the room at Wake and Winston-Salem State letters alone. <laughs> yeah, that woman loved herself some Winston-Salem. Mm. Yeah, calling herself a Carolina gal. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't easy to get her to agree to move to D.C. She said she had to stay in the Virginia side, though. <laughs> How old was I again? About 15 months. I got this opportunity back then, and here I stand 16 years later. Business trip, 2000 or something. <laughs> I really wanted to go with you this time. Oh, uh, no, nah, nah, not doing these times. It's crazy out here. A little weird, too. All of the protocols, precautions, temperature checks, face coverings, medical certificates. Besides, there isn't, you know, much going on for tourists you know, out here. You know, mainly just businesses trying to stay afloat. I'm only here because this is the last out of town tour for me, you know, for the rest of the year. Uh, this one sets up all the other meetings. <laughs> rest of the year? Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> what are you going to do when I graduate and go off in the fall? <sighs> oh, well, like I, like I tell you, baby girl, you, you got to plan ahead, a few steps ahead, so you'll, you'll have options, you know? What happens if you, you know, if you if you go wherever you want to go and they shut down on campus and they send you back home because of COVID? I got you covered. I just we just sit at the house here together through your first couple of semesters and you know, it'll be all right. Wonderful. Ouch. I'm just kidding. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> no, no, I get it. I, I wanted to 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 get to school so bad that I probably would have stayed during the holidays if I could have. <laughs> So you understand if I hope you're wrong about next year? Yeah, I, I hope I am wrong too, baby. Speaking of understanding and people being wrong about things. Yes. It's my senior project. The one you've been avoided telling me about off gate? Then you and that 80s slang. <laughs> you don't talk like that in your meetings. Yeah, you, you, yeah you're right. I, um, it's called code switching. Code switching. Yes. <laughs> That's right. You'll learn, especially if you pick one of those highfalutin schools. <laughs> PWI, Dad. What? PWI, predominantly white institution. <laughs> okay. Well, except for the HBCUs, aren't they all? Anyway, <laughs> stop stalling. What's your project? <laughs> well, like you, I was thinking about mom. Yeah. Her birthday was coming up in all. Her love for North Carolina. Yeah, so. <laughs> Mr. Thompson gave us a list to choose from a few weeks ago, and Wachovia was on it. Oh, really? Um, economic study? I mean, that's, you know, that's the bank she, she used to work for. I know. I remember you all talking about it when it went away. Yeah. Uh, but not the bank. What? Now, what company would brand itself with the same name of a bought-out company that's, you know... Uh, How about the bank took the name from some other place? Hmm? I never really thought about it. I, I always assumed that it was a Native American name or something. You know, um, do you want to explore the Native American heritage? You know, some of the family pictures that I have of the old place and stuff. No, know. Dad, but there is a Native American that part of it Oh, so what's the subject, Sarah? Why are you being so vague? It's your project, unless, um, uh-uh, Sarah. I know you wouldn't. Dad, like you said, it's my project. Yeah, but I sent you to one of the most prestigious private schools in D.C., and you get out, and to get you out of North Carolina and their Southern BS, and you managed to drag your bright mind into something that has to do with race, haven't you? I know, but Wachovia and, and mom, I mean, if mama weren't there, it looked interesting. <laughs> interesting how? Well, and what did, did Wachovia turn out to mean anyway? Complicated. But long story short, 
and sort of the area around Winston-Salem and how it looked to the first group of people sent from Pennsylvania to build their town on some land that they had bought to settle on. They thought it resembled the beauty of the place near Germany that they had come from. It gave them a feeling of peace, a kind of utopia that they were looking for. Oh, yeah, for them. But it's probably, you know, happened while we were still slaves, right? North Carolina? I don't want to forget her. What? I don't want to forget her, Dad. These may have been Mom's people. I, I want to know about her city. What started it all? What had to happen to that she could be brought into existence and have me? Sarah, this is already starting off bad. You're, you're holding out on me for a couple of weeks, not to mention the subject matter. Please, Dad, it sort of all came together in a way that I just can't explain. It sort of happened and... And, and what? And ever since, it's like I can hear the story of the people in my head. The research has been interesting already. Well, you didn't seem too happy about it though. I mean, you were, those voices you were dreaming about when I woke you up? Yeah, and what do you always tell me? Doing something that you are meant to do may not always mean that you're happy about doing it, but if you do it right, the sense of accomplishment is the payoff in the end. You are definitely your mother's daughter. <laughs> Reminding me of what I said. Just know that I am not pleased. I know, Dad. <laughs> and, and don't blame me if you develop some kind of trauma or victim syndrome or slavery PTSD. Uh, I get it, Dad, but it's our heritage. Not one that we should be proud of. And why not? We should be proud of the fact that we've made it through all of it. <laughs> and that's the point. We haven't. I see things from this side of the pendulum that we're still experiencing, you know, the effects of slavery. I work this job every day knowing that one mistake, that one mistake, I'm one mistake away from having nothing. No travel, no fancy house, no private school, no legacy, no nothing. So why do you do it? You. And the way I felt when I looked into your mother's eyes, knowing that I could take care of her the way I wanted to until three years ago when I couldn't do anything safe. But we, we put up an awful fight. You know, we, she didn't want for anything. I know, Dad. You were and are still our hero. But with or without that fancy job and et cetera, et cetera, I mean, you. And I'm probably not that guy if, if, if you had to struggle from paycheck to paycheck. And I wouldn't be your little girl without the private school? I didn't say that. But your rationale is, what are you so afraid of in the history of our people that you think you have been shielding me from? Think? <laughs> Even with Superman or Thor, they find themselves having to get back to the ones that they love and sometimes not get back in time enough to save them. Most times they are left scarred either way. Dad, we live in Northern Virginia outside of DC in America. And you think that you can shield me from the ugly parts of life? Wow, that was good. <laughs> I have to com commend your administrators and teachers on helping you to make sure that you can communicate your point like that. But after I let you know that I'm not pleased with even the potential that there would be a project that would include a hint of slavery, um, then <clears throat> we know the story. There are so many other things that we can do academic research on for elevating your mind and helping others to elevate theirs without going there. See, that's why I didn't want to, want, want to tell you. I mean, I knew you would react like this. I probably should have just invited you to the live report and let you see it for yourself. <laughs> and you probably should be getting to bed too. We'll talk about it on Friday. And tell your Aunt D, I I said thanks for staying over the past week. If you need anything, just, just text me. I, I gotta think about this. Um, I love you, baby girl. Okay, Dad. Love you. Good night. Good night. Genesis chapter 9. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. 
These three were the sons of Noah, and from them the whole earth was populated. 20. Now Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. 21. But when he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. 22. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. 23. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment and placed it across their shoulders, and walking backward, they covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. And that's why black people are those cursed children of Ham. That's why black people are those cursed children of Ham. But it was not specifically black people in the beginning. There was a medieval writer representing the lords of the manors who proclaimed that the peasants of Great Britain were the descendants of Ham, and that's why they had to serve. The term slave originally came from Slavic, the people who've been captured on the eastern frontiers of Europe. It was the fifth century when the Portuguese went into Africa that leaders began to specifically identify Africans who had the curse. But the idea is that one branch of human family had to be enslaved because of this curse was a kind of one-size-fits-all oppressor story because any ruling body can decide whatever group they want to enslave and oppress and claim that they are the descendants of Ham. Christianity has done different things at different times to go along with people in power who want to justify cruel behavior by by arguing that it's going to bring people to Christ for salvation's sake. Not separating church from state created the colonial machine that manipulated information, that created the knowledge which was used to define non-European populations. And then, when governments got through with using the church, they conveniently moved from Christianity to liberalism to notions of humanitarianism to capitalism. Christianity's role in the political folly and greed that fueled Atlantic slavery is a complex history that basically helped people accept slavery as part of the order of things. With the introduction of the rigid slave system to North America, which exploited both Indian and African bodies as a human commodity, indigenous people became part of that economy on both sides of the transaction. West Indians from the Northeast captured enemy tribes to trade to the English Virginians for guns, ammunition, metal tools, and other goods. And in the West, the buying and selling of Indians, even though it was illegal once California entered the Union as a free state, was common practice. In 1819, the Cherokee Nation passed slave codes that regulated slave trade, forbade intermarriage, enumerated punishment for runaway slaves, and prohibited slaves from owning private property. An 1820 law regulated trading with slaves, requiring that anyone who traded with a slave without the master's permission was bound to the legal owner for the property, or its value, if the traded property proved to be stolen. Another code declared that a fine of $15 was to be levied for masters who allowed slaves to buy or sell liquor. The Cherokee adopted the practice of using enslaved Africans on their plantations. Most Cherokee held fewer slaves than whites and labored with them. Slaves worked primarily as agricultural laborers cultivating both cotton for their master's profit and food for consumption. Some slaves were skilled laborers, such as seamstresses and blacksmiths. Like other slaveholders, affluent Cherokee used slaves as a portable labor force. They developed robust farms, salt mines, and trading posts created with slave labor. Slaves worked primarily as agricultural laborers, cultivating both cotton for their master's profit and food for consumption. Some slaves were skilled laborers, such as seamstresses and blacksmiths. Like other slaveholders, affluent Cherokee used slaves as a portable labor force. They developed robust farms, salt mines, and trading posts created with slave labor. The situation of the congregational town of Salem, at least in one respect, is found to be entirely different from that of any other town of a brethren's congregation. It has been guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States 
and is permitted by the laws of the state of North Carolina, the right to own slaves. Whatever the views of the first brethren who settled here may have been, their descendants who were born and brought up here gradually drew away from the views of their fathers, became accustomed to the sight of slavery as it was presented itself all around them. Declarations were made about slavery, that the keeping of Negro slaves was irreconcilable with the Brotherhood, with Christianity, and so forth, but its practice seemed to show the opposite. Even in the early mission stations in the West Indies, Negro slaves were kept for the carrying on of trades and for domestic service. It is therefore not strange that the brethren in Wachovia soon similarly employed Negroes in congregational services and in the economy of the choir houses. But soon, the increase of Negroes in Salem threatened to become harmful to the external as well as the internal welfare of the town. They felt strongly the necessity of limiting the great influx of Negroes and especially of regulating as best they could the holding of the same. As a result, the following rules were formulated and laid down in the year 1820 by the Congregational Council. Concerning the holding of slaves in the Congregational Town of Salem, adopted by the Congregation Council on February 24th, 1820. One, with no trade or profession carried on inside of Salem, under any condition whatsoever, is any slave to be accepted and admitted for the learning or practice of a trade. Whether it may be one who belongs to those who administer or themselves own the trade or profession or have rented the slave, or such as have been brought here by someone else for the learning of the same, or have come here in any other manner or under any other condition whatsoever. And if it happens that anything whatsoever of the kind has occurred or should occur later, it shall be the duty of the collegium and the congregational diaconate to be mindful in all seriousness for the removal of this evil at once. At once. The man was Peter Oliver, a literate bilingual brickmaker and potter from North Carolina. He knew that the law in Pennsylvania prohibited anyone from importing a slave into the state and that doing so would mean his immediate liberation. So Oliver claimed his right. He swore to a statement that he was being held for the sole purpose of being a slave. He knew the details of his sale and perhaps had the document itself to prove it. Then he signed his name, Peter Oliver. Peter Oliver verily believes that he is entitled to his freedom. The judge ordered a writ of habeas corpus. That is his owner, Peter Lenhart of Warwick Township, had to appear before the judge and show cause why Oliver was being held. Leonard complied and presented the bill of sale. Oliver was being held because he had been legally purchased as a slave in North Carolina. The judge, Frederick Kuhn, then wrote out an order to immediately release Oliver. The law that he cited was an amendment to the 1780 Act for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery, passed in 1788 to clarify the first law and to close loopholes. Kuhn quoted the appropriate clause that all and every slave and slaves who shall be brought into this state by persons inhabiting or residing therein or intending to inhabit or reside therein shall be immediately considered deemed and taken to be free to all intents and purposes. Kuhn's order concluded, I do therefore on due advisement and consideration had of all and singular the premises liberate set free and discharge the said Peter Oliver, Negro from the said Peter Leonard. A Moravian memoir of his life states that Peter Oliver bought himself free. Despite being a slave, he had the skills and determination to earn the money for his own purchase. Peter Leonard, the Pennsylvania man who bought Oliver, was a Moravian from the Latitz area. Leonard knew the law. In fact, he seems to have been a lawyer. He became a justice of the peace in 1802, and the household inventory made when he died included law books. The North Carolina man who sold him, another Moravian, had a brother who was a brickmaker in Lititz. All the pieces fit to form a theory of what happened. 
Peter Oliver earned the money that Lehnert used to buy him. Then Lehnert brought Oliver to Pennsylvania as a slave with the intention of allowing him to claim his freedom. After he did, remarkably, Peter Oliver returned to North Carolina. He continued living in the Moravian communities of Salem, working as a potter and farming a few acres of rented land. He married, had two children, and died there in 1810. Two, if anyone cannot otherwise get help for his domestic and family work, he must apply to the Collegium for permission to procure the necessary help by a slave. The Collegium has to consider the case, and if it seems suitable, give the desired permission, but strictly under the following conditions. A. The applicant before he acquires a slave must truthfully present the matter as to how he intends to keep the same, whether he is to belong to him or whether he intends to rent him. B. Hereupon he must obligate himself by a bond to be given to the proprietor of double the worth of the slave if he belongs to him or double the annual rent if he only rents him to remove the slave from the town within four weeks if it has been required of him by the collegium and in no case to bring him back without its express approval. My name is Abraham. I guess on the account I is the first Negro bought by these good Christian people. I cannot understand why they say they want to save my soul and still have me as they slave. Of course, all these good Christians are like that. So I ran away. One of the brothers acted as justice and sentenced me to the punishment I deserve for running away, costing them money for my capture and return. You see, I was out and, well, these people is a little strange, but very predictable and peaceful people. No guns and all that. So I strolled down to the water hole and then I goes to the single brother's house and sooner or later, I just started walking. I should have plotted out my course to think which way I was walking, but it was sort of just happening, you know? Next thing I knew, I was miles away from everybody and everything. And all of a sudden I realized I didn't have no plan. So how am I gonna get away to freedom? This road, to Savannah, but it's a long way to any kind of freedom, that direction. Who gonna supply me with food or drink, shelter? There's the Catawba Indians in the woods and that they get paid to fetch runaways. And I ain't afraid of no woods, but you never know. That's when it just come to me to enjoy my freedom while I had it. If I make it to somewhere far, then so be it. But I just stopped thinking about it and enjoyed the present. The Moravanians weren't bad, but I wasn't free. Working for them all the time. <laughs> maybe, maybe I want to work for myself. You see, people who has never been bound don't know how much freedom swell up in your bones. Like, like being trapped indoors all day and, and not being able to go outside, <laughs> something like that. You, you get restless and, and, and ready to move around without restrictions. Nobody telling you what to do. And, and then I get to thinking, maybe I could try to find some of my kin, <laughs> my mama and, and sisters and brothers. But they was all at the plantation where they can't just stroll away from like I did. And I hate to tempt them to do the wrong things like that. So I just 
stayed in the woods and was eating berries, trying to live off the land, living on some of the berries and, and some of the old folks used to teach us about. <laughs> I make it three weeks, but I was some kind of miserable. I started to feel guilty for not caring about whether I was going to get caught or not. I was hungry, cold, dirty. <laughs> I mean, more dirty than unusual, but, but that didn't feel right. They found me down by the Catawba River. The major at Fort Dobbs sent me back to Salem. They had to pay for his finder's fee and and then it was time for me to get my punishment. One of the younger brothers did the punishing because he had some whipping to do for his own slave, but he took me first. <clears throat> he bore it patiently and meekly. <clears throat> He wore himself out. <laughs> it's a good thing, too. I was determined to bear it long enough so he wouldn't have to punish his female slave. A negress. I figured it was better for her that way if your master had to get somebody else to do their whipping. A little less anger involved. Hmm. I made a friend for life. Extra food for me when, when she had the mind to. <laughs> I never give them no more trouble. I was good from then on. What's the point? They got us surrounded from here to the sea. Yep, I was Sambo then, but they changed my name Abraham because the Negro Sam, who had been for some years in service in Bethabara, and who had expressed a desire to learn and to know the Savior, was brought up to repent and to be saved. We now call you Brother Abraham. Because I was the first of my kind in the town of Salem. When the church member Abraham, a slave, died in April 1797 in Salem, rather than hold the funeral service in German, the predominant language of the community. The church leaders held it in English, since some of the Negroes from the neighborhood attended. The Negro, Jacob, was whipped again. Why? He admitted that he had poisoned a brother's horse, which died suddenly yesterday. He also acknowledged the theft from his brother George's place, and others, but was confused in his answers as to where he had hidden the things, saying, in the woods, and again that they were in the hay, and that he would have to look and find them himself. But he did not produce any, and then he said that he had sent them to another Negro. Jacob is full of wickedness and malice, and we will have to sell him, and the sooner, the better. The smallpox continues to spread. In the brother's house, three older boys and one little boy are sick. Jacob shows signs of smallpox. At least he's not getting into mischief. I will pray for his soul. Last night, things were stolen from three places. One brother lost a silk neckerchief and a handkerchief. Another lost 28 skeins of cotton yarn and from the sister's house garden. Some stockings, gloves, etc. are missing. Suspicion falls on an Irishman. He and his wife have been staying nearby and they were in Salem yesterday and had a good opportunity to look around. Never mind, Jacob's up and around. We need to take the first opportunity to sell him, and as far away as possible. For there is danger that he will do something worse out of spite. Maybe take him to Georgia. The Cherokee may need an extra slave. Last night, about a quart crock full of butter was stolen from the milk house. Apparently, the milk in the crock was drunk, and then it was filled with butter. Probably a family camping overnight not far from town had need of it. Probably a family camping overnight not far from town had need of it. Don't bother. Jacob! 
Jacob ran away last night to escape punishment for his bad conduct of various kinds. He only went as far as neighboring farm and they brought him back today. He took his punishment without trying to beg off and admitted that he was the thief who stole the things. Mr. Lanier came to see about the purchase of the Negro Jacob, but for fear of smallpox, he did not come all the way into the town. Number three. The Collegium shall, however, be expressly obliged to demand this, as soon as well-founded complaints arise from the behavior of such a slave, particularly with female persons, if they become pregnant, or even if they are found guilty of frivolous behavior, or if there should be present well-founded reasons to believe that a slave is secretly learning a trade or profession, or if any cause is at hand which seems to the Collegium to make it necessary for such a slave to be removed from the community. The Negro Caesar has behaved very badly. He was whipped and sent away from the tavern. This morning, the brothers rode to Mr. Lanier to close the trade for our Negro Jacob. He is to buy him at the value of 105 pounds, paying in hard money, grain, and cattle. We have been hoping for signs of true repentance on the part of the Negro, but he shows none. So it is better to sell him than to risk further damage from him. The Negro woman, Frankie, because of her bad behavior, was sold to a stranger. Caspar Stoltz, Revolutionary War patriot raised in the Bethania Moravian Church, who fought against Cherokee, sold Pleasant to the Wachovia Unity April 2nd, 1805, for 16 and a half acres of land and $50 in cash. Pleasant accompanied the Markland family and the Wachovia missionaries to Spring Place in Georgia in 1805 and birthed a mulatto son, Michael, on the way. Once back, she would live out her final years in Salem. This afternoon, a man came to take the Negro Jacob to his new master, Mr. Lanier. The Negro Caesar, who has worked at the still house for nearly a month, was allowed to return to the tavern, he and his wife both asking it and promising to get along together nicely. The Negro Jacob, who formerly belonged to us, came his master, Mr. Lanier, and wanted to get his clothes but he was sent away empty-handed, for in the first place, they did not belong to him, and in the second place, he had done much damage here. Number four, concerning the plantations adjacent to Salem, their inhabitants are likewise bound by their leases and agreements to keep no one, particularly no slave, in their service, if the same is dangerous to the welfare and morality of the place. The Negro sister Maria will take charge of the kitchen. Maria! A mulatto girl was bought for $275 from the man who owned the Negro Caesar and his wife. She is to be set free in 17 years. Mr. Lanier brought slaughtered hogs in payment for the Negro Jacob who has run away from him. He said he would have to send his cattle away for men were shooting and killing them in the woods, both his and those belonging to others. Mr. Lanier has given five notes dated the 15th of this month the Negro brother Samuel came from Bethabara and was formally betrothed to the Negro sister Mary. This was Unity Day. At two o'clock was the baptism of our Negro Frank. He received the name Christian. Two soldiers and eight Negroes came from General Morgan's camp, were fed, and thankfully returned thither. Yesterday, a family came in flight from Georgia, bringing about 20 Negroes. Like others before, they camped in the woods opposite the tavern, and the place looks like a Negro village. Number five. Other than under the conditions cited, no Negro whatsoever under any condition, whatever shall be kept in the congregational town of Salem. Though he may be like other day laborers, but even in this case, only under the condition of immediate dismissal as soon as required by the collegium. In order to avoid loss on the tickets, which have been exchanged for certificates, which can be used only in the purchase of confiscated land and Negroes, it was suggested that they be collected and sent to Salisbury to be used in buying Negroes on December 15th. Some of these Negroes can be used to advantage in our towns. The rest can be resold. The value of the certificates and the risk shall be divided proportionately between the holders of the certificates. The two Negroes, Samuel and Christian from Bethabara, and our Abraham shall be called to hope for the baptism of the Negro Jupiter next Sunday. 
In connection with this, it was agreed that when there are baptisms of adults in the country congregations, the candidates shall wear not only robes, but other white clothing. Brother Meyer intends to take the old Negro Caesar and his wife from Bethabara into the Salem Tavern. Negro Brother Christian of Bethabara married the Negress Patty, who is a candidate for baptism. The marriage took place at the tavern. Number six. Those brothers and sisters who already have permission of this sort will likewise have to give such a bond for the slaves standing in their service. Our Negro girl, Kathy, serving in the tavern, passed peacefully to the Savior, just as the musicians were practicing the very tunes which it is customary to use on such occasions. This afternoon, the body of our Negress, Kathy, was buried on our God's acre. When she was about eight years old, she and her mother were sold to the brethren in Bethabara, and she served there until she came with the Myers to the Salem Tavern, where she gave industrious and faithful service until her last illness. Until she became sick, she had not been especially interested in salvation, but finally she became deeply concerned about it and received the visits and the conversations of the sisters as a great favor. Before her end, the Savior showed her grace and took her to himself as a poor, redeemed sinner. She was about 18 years old. Hello, Miss Ferguson. Hello, Mr. Anderson. So I see we're going to be formal today. I thought it best under the circumstances. Didn't you get my message? Yes, I did. You were specific yet vague. I find it fascinating how you do that, but I guess that's what makes you who you are. Yes, I was trying to convey in my message that I was a little perplexed about how concerned I was about what appears to be a glitch in your curriculum. Meaning? Meaning, I know that when we talked about setting up this academy and what it was all about and what should be happening here. Yes, and I think the past six years have gone great. Yes, they have, which is why I was perplexed, befuddled, because I know that we specifically mentioned that I did, you know, did not want my daughter spinning her wheels, wasting precious time, creating projects that deal with slavery and, and, and inequality and the inability to do this and do that. And, and I know that the board and I were very clear about that. I remember that. I was there. Mm -hmm. And we have been very purposeful about making sure that no one spins their wheels or wastes time in any of our classes. And why am I hearing about my daughter working on a project, her senior project, that's having to deal with slavery of, of all things, Ms. Ferguson? Well, Mr. Anderson, as you also know, I try to also recruit the brightest minds in our country to execute the curriculum here. And to do that, there, is, there are procedures on the educational side of things that should allow for academic freedom in the classroom. And yes, we did talk about the curriculum and what would be part of our base, our mantle. And when we started this school, was it not clear that issues that deal with slavery were off the table? And like I said, I like to give my teachers the latitude to teach the subjects that they are experts in. An inventive and poignant way, teaching it their style, their voice. And as a corporate lawyer, that sounds like a lot of educational rhetoric that, that, that is employed at every other school in the country as a way to cover all explanations in the place of accountability. As the principal of this educational institution, I'm offended. And as, as one of the founding board members and major co contributors and a parent of a bright and successful child, I'm offended. I assure you that academic freedom is the legitimacy a perk for my staff and the students. Andrew, you've known me since before this school started. And the issues that goes on in this school system that decimates our children first and foremost. So yeah. you know I don't let anything become an excuse for nonsense. Well, and that's why I called you and left the message. And as awkward as it is to discuss this via technology, 
such as it is, I felt it necessary to have this discussion as soon as possible. Yes, and that's why I set aside some time to see what your concerns were and to have you meet one of the young teachers that chose all the senior project topics this year. Okay, wonderful. Let me, uh, let me guess. He's a young, idealistic, beginning of career type who thinks all people are created equal. Andrew, give him a chance. Look, I don't have the time or energy to explain a position that I already have made clear. Really? You're the one that always says that you were never too busy or tied up to handle anything that come up to the school. Yes, but I, I yes, but. <laughs> but this is one of those times. I need you to listen. All right, I'll listen. Do you know how many schools wanted this man? How he took this job despite the limitations of this place on his ability to keep us the cutting edge on what's going on out there in the real world for this generation. A generation that I have paved the way for, meeting after meeting. Andrew, if you are not careful, especially now, this generation is going to leave us. They're going to leave us behind, Andrew. All right, put them on. Lord help me. Mr. Williams, how are you doing this morning? I'm good, thank you. And yourself? I'm having a great meeting. Sorry to disturb your open period. Oh, no, nah, that's OK. I finally get to meet the architect of this great institution, and I dare say one of the founding members of our board. I am so grateful to you, Mr. Anderson. I could not pass up the opportunity to work here after, you know, while in progress of finishing up my doctoral degree. The plan set up here is an awesome one. Thank you. I'm impressed already. I want you understand how much has gone into making this school an institution that is rare and special which is why I wanted to discuss with Ms. Ferguson, my daughter's senior project. Oh, Alcovia. I would be happy to. What specifically do you have questions about? Well, when I and the board and your principal discussed creating the curriculum for the school, there were certain things that we wanted to stay clear of so that the students here wouldn't have to you know, be forced to think of themselves as second-class citizens, et cetera, et cetera. And slavery was one of them. I see. I knew it would be controversial, but I, I didn't see a problem with the challenge of making it a project that makes it not about slavery itself, but you know about the making of America and the world, which includes slavery and other related subjects. Yeah, so why not something about science or technology? <laughs> Mr. Ferguson, as you know, these senior projects are exhaustingly thorough and must again demonstrate how it still grows the initial topic, a localized thought or action to an impactful worldview. Yes, I, I get that. So which science would you have picked for your daughter? Uh, I don't know. Um, um, oh, okay. Uh, how about biology? Works for me. Does it? You mean the science founded on Darwinian principles of survival of the fittest used to justify the genocide of whole groups of people, an alibi for being judge and jury of races around the world, principles based on natural selection that claim that since insects and animals evolved into species of the world, why hadn't humans done the same thing? Theories known as the social Darwinism with men like the biologist Henry Huxley, who thought certain people are successful because of their race. And here comes colonialism and human competition that explains and justifies global expansion favoring an evolution of a race based on the hierarchy of specialists you find throughout the plant and the animal world. So what's next? Anatomy? Anthropology? Okay, let's... Dr. Robert Knox. You see, he stole bodies out of graves in England, got caught, disappeared for a while, and then published a book that summed up that race determines your character, which determines your position in civilization, which determines your destiny. And that the superior races would dominate the natural inferior ones and will never tolerate them, never accept them. <laughs> this then justifies a war of extermination. 
in America, a group led by craniologist Samuel George Morton had begun to collect the skulls of different races and compare them. You see, he measured them because he figured that the skull was the container of the most in part of the human body, the brain. Then he surmised the bigger the skull, the bigger the brain. And they judged the shape of the skull, the shape of the brain, and the American skull uh, the American School of Race Sciences concluded that the races as measured through their skulls were so different as to be separate species. Tasmanians, Africans, African Americans, and Indians were not the lower races of men. They perhaps were not human at all. You see, at least in the Constitution, we were three-fifths of a human being. Well, what about medicine? Medicine! The hospital care. You see, Charles Darwin's cousin, Sir Francis Galton, anxious about the fact that lower classes were growing faster than the middle class, and then he theorized enough to wake in an area known as eugenics, creating whole groups of intellectuals to ponder and to act and to experiment. <sighs> Charles Davenport and his followers, in order to defend the health and purity of the white race, sought to identify and, and sought to identify those classes and those races in America who may be considered genetically unfair fit so that they could sterilize them. Eugenic laws determine where you went to school, what cemetery you were buried in, wh where you could live, who, who you could marry. You see, and then these marriage laws said that white people could not marry blacks, people could not marry outside their groups, Indians could not marry with blacks, and et cetera, and et cetera. Okay, okay, well, let's, let's go over to the arts then. <laughs> ah, the arts, yes. Scientists used the arts to spread their propaganda as they went around methodically tracking ancestry and targeting bloodlines for extinction. And then these people, they, you know, you know, they thought that they were saving humanity. They, they were artists, liberals, and reformers. As a worldwide movement in Sweden, an official program forcibly sterilized 60,000 mental patients and members of the ethnic minorities. In Britain, the eugenic society received widespread support, but it was in Germany that the radical ideas of the American eugenics movement provided more than just inspiration. American foundations bankrolled the development of German eugenics at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Anthropology and Human Heredity with Rockefeller Foundation grants, IBM Technology, and the leading scientist Eugene Fischer led to the sterilization of the racially mixed people of Germany's Rhineland, 400 of them, all children, which led to 70,000 adult mentally ill patients being gassed. Then they went on to help the SS who had large numbers of prisoners, like those who, who, wore, who, who wore glasses and, and, had, and had an injured limb or, or just something of that. And then, of course, the world found the Jewish concentration camps and then the millions, the millions that were killed there, but they were just trying to be just like their spiritual predecessors, the race scientists and the social Darwinists of the age of empire and colonialism. Well, I'm okay. I'm more on the corporate side, so economics, you know, business. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Economist Herbert Spencer, a social Darwinist, suggested that there had to be losers in this great cosmic process, and the losers were those peoples who could not compete based upon the ideas of individualism, utilitarian moral theory, social and biological evolution, limited government, and laissez-faire laissez economics all season with a pitch of something that tastes like superior and inferior races. Now, now tell me, pick one that is not eventually, you know, all connected to race. Look, all I was saying is that- All I was saying is the British greed in creating cash crops for the world caused 8 million Indians to die in the 1870s because of famine while they were out, you know, throwing a banquet full of food for 6,000 attendees on quick Queen Victoria's success. And, and then it continued into the 1880s and the 1890s with almost 13 million people dying in India. Now we move into countries to surgically and remove what we want, thinking we aren't affecting the people, just, just their land. You know, we take the sulfur, coltan, diamonds, gold, cash crops, etc., all for the gold, global market. Well, well, how about sociology? Sociology, yes. 
the darnest use of the darnest use survival of the fittest whereby a famine or disease could be actually seen as an instrument of darwinian winnowing out groups of people who are inferior to die sociology the Darwinist use survival of the fittest, whereby a famine or disease could be actually seen as an instrument of winnowing out groups of people who they believed were inferior and going to die anyway. But see, they failed to see that all too often interference with people and their culture and their lives with or without care could interfere with and dismantle ancient systems that have sustained those people for thousands of years. Yeah, but you know, getting all worked up into over North America. The disease and the war devastated the Native Americans, and all the nations of the Australian mainland have been all but annihilated. Just like they totally wiped out the, Tasmania, the Tasmanians, in Namibia and all across America, the scramble for wealth killed literally millions. I mean, 90% of the African continent was divvied up by all of the world powers and then totally taken over in the span of three years, completely wiping out various tribes. Oh, 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 oh yeah. And then and they, they tried to fix it with exhibits and stuff they called museums. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Do you know what a polymath is? No, I can't say that I do. All right, it's someone who contributes to a wide range of subjects like the Darwinists, which include tainting ethics, religion, anthropology, economics, political theory, philosophy, literature, the arts, astronomy, biology, sociology, and psychology. And, and yes, uh, they especially do religious groups and their leaders by having them sent out missionaries who, who still talk about the equality of mankind and everyone descending from Adam and Eve and, and how the truth and the only truth comes from some written doctrine. But eventually, once they use them to, to get they're, they, they thought they were being terribly naive that they can't be saved and they were being extraordinary old fashioned that they simply can't, you know, they simply have failed to come to terms with the great scientific thinking of the age. Look, in the end, the racial thing is real. But funny thing is, if they run out of races and ethnicities to annihilate, the greedy will get somebody to turn on somebody based on their differences. Mr. Williams, you want Mr. Ferguson to revisit the Moravian Project because? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. You know, I can, I can get carried away sometimes. Yeah, no kidding. The Moravians went to missions without political prompting, without silencing women, and they did and still do a lot of things right when it comes to race. Though they became intertwined with the throes of slavery, like all religion did and does, they got a lot right, and I wanted a student to illuminate that in a broad, broader sense. I'm sorry, but it has to directly include slavery and race issues. All right, Mr. Williams. Yeah. I'm sure your break is over. Don't, oh. don't worry. I sent Miss Martin to sit in your class. Oh, thank you. Mr. Ferguson and I will talk. Yeah. I'll get back to you. All righty then, all righty then. <laughs> Good to meet you, sir. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> well? Well, what? You know, I forgot to ask him about, you know, straight math or, or chemistry. Get right? off my screen, man. <laughs> we both got work to do. <laughs> all right. Be all safe right. out there. I will. And Dee, your sister will be so proud of you. What? For handling you? <laughs> Who do you think taught her? Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> During the love feast, five single men and nine single women, one married Negro and two married Negresses, were received into the society. The entire group was filled with joy and hope at this gracious visitation from the Savior. Mr. Blum came with the news that the Negro Jacob had run away for good. He bought an advertisement, which was at once posted on the tavern, and a copy was sent to Richmond by a traveler who was going thither. Neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, 
but all one in Christ Jesus. Neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, but all one in Christ Jesus. Neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, but all one in Christ Jesus. In 1735, the unity of the brethren, commonly called Moravians in the New World, was the first group to establish a mission in the newly formed British colony. In an effort to escape the persecution and oppression in Central Europe for their stances, the Moravians came to British North America expressly to evangelize Native Americans and were strong on pacifism and separation of church and state. Neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, but all one in Christ Jesus. Neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, but all one in Christ Jesus. Moravian missionaries, brother Peter Rose and his wife, sister Catherine, founded Irene, a spiritual outpost about a mile from Savannah. Irene lasted until January 1739, when war clouds began to gather as England and Spain commenced hostilities and the War of Jenkins' Ear ensued. Since the Moravians refused to bear arms, Georgia officials forced them to leave the colony in 1740. They went to Pennsylvania, where they eventually founded Bethlehem and ministered to Indians in the Middle Colonies. In 1753, a group of Moravians in Wachovia sent out for the region surrounding Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and made religious forays into the Cherokee Nation, which was then located in the Appalachian Mountains of the Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee. During the Revolutionary Era, they failed to establish a mission enterprise. By the 1790s, however, as war subsided in the New Republic, U.S. policymakers, beginning with George Washington, encouraged Christian missions. At this time, most of the Cherokees and some Creeks resided in Georgia. The Cherokees particularly, and the Creeks to a certain extent, were amenable to such missions for the purpose of teaching English and other useful civilization arts, but they were unfriendly towards Christianity. At Spring Place in Georgia, Moravians welcomed visitors from all parts of the Cherokee Nation and the United States. For the Cherokee youth to receive the full benefit of the mission's educational goal, most of them roomed and boarded at Spring Place. The mission housed some 114 Cherokee children from 1804 to 1833, when Georgia citizens forced its closing. Neither Jew or Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, but all one in Christ Jesus. At Salem's female boarding school, Brother Steiner preached the first service the 24th of March, 1822. Brother Steiner explained the plan and announced monthly services to be held expressly for them. Neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, but all one in Christ Jesus. Written and published in 1829 by David Walker, a free African-American and a Wilmington native living in Boston, Appeal issued a ringing call for abolition of slavery. In addition, it urged slaves to take matters into their own hands. Whites were thrown into panic, and the North Carolina legislature hurriedly tightened its black code to keep slaves in order. Boston, in January 1831, William Lloyd Garrison began publishing the abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator. Closer to home, in 1830, copies of Appeal in four articles were appearing in Eastern North Carolina. Neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, but all one in Christ Jesus. But all one in Christ Jesus. Husband. Are you still alive? You seem troubled. These state slave laws, not allowing reading or writing to be taught. You know, we have come so far, and yet I feel like we are slipping into a carnality. What do we want history to remember about us? It's not left to us, that is up to the Lord. As his vessels, it's our responsibility to be his representatives. Yet in this nation, we buy and sell human beings. You know, we are to be a light unto the world. We are, Matthew. Look how much Salem has grown, the whole of Wachovia. 
they're reaping the fruits of our labor. Isn't that what we hoped and we prayed for? But the people, they grow restless every day. Rumors of war among the states. Sometimes war is a necessary tool. When I think of our brethren in the Caribbean and all that they accomplished living together, I marvel at their success. Those slaves set free. Set free with no provisions. While the planters got a king's ransom to repair their lives and the workers left with nothing. Let us pray that the Lord might offer us inspiration at today's meeting. We must quell a tide that is surely coming. You have done a lot of thinking and researching on this project. Sarah, I'm so proud of you. I mean, you should have no problems nailing your presentation tomorrow. Mr. Williams, there is so much information. I'm not sure how to shape it. Well, see, that's the thing about history. We want to go through it in a few minutes, cutting corners and omitting details of a person's whole life. Groups of people. Yeah, and then you add institutions and countries and communities, and then all of that can just be so overwhelming. Tell me about it. But you knew that was going to happen, didn't you? Well, I do have a job as a teacher here. <laughs> yeah. It really inspired me to take a closer look at things. Like in what way? Well, like how one suggestion by one person, whether you like them or not, can affect a chain of events, even if it wasn't a suggestion in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Someone somewhere is going to take it to heart and then go ahead and do something with it. For the good and the bad. You got it. Bartolome de la Casas. What? Bartolome de la Casas. He was the one who inadvertently, as most of my sources allude to, suggested using Africans instead of Indians, as they called them then, to fuel the European capital campaign to make the New World a source of wealth. You see, that's still the problem with capitalism. Someone somewhere is always going to get exploited or dominated. Yeah. And he regretted saying it later, according to what I saw, but he was just trying to get the courts to pull back on the atrocious things that the conquistadors were doing to the New World indigenous people. And what's with the cutting off of body parts? Spain in the New World, Belgium in the Congo, whites in the South? The chopping off of noses, hands, feet, private parts. Hey, everybody thinks it makes a movie good to have just a little gore, but it keeps someone in that mental loop. Speaking of being in the loop, the Moravians were always just kind of in the loop, trying to change things for the better. Even from the beginning, when the initial dude, Huss, tried to tell the Catholic Church that they had to change some things. And then a small group loyal to him just maintained and influenced all the other groups at some point in time. Mm-hmm. A little bit of everywhere. Yeah. Like that person you didn't notice who's in all the photos and major events. <laughs> but just a little creepy. <laughs> exactly. Other groups were saying that they were peculiar and a little off for letting women speak in church, living in a communal way, helping the Native American to become more knowledgeable living with slaves to really evangelize them, not keep them subservient. As best as they could, living under the dangerous political cloud that governs slavery and European dominance. In the Caribbean and other parts of the world, they lit a spiritual fire that is still alive today. Yeah, you see, it was that Caribbean punch that caused the abolitionists to have enough witnesses to pressure England to end slavery there before the U.S. did. And over here, they tried to just evangelize the Cherokee and slaves, but got run out of Georgia. And they did okay in Pennsylvania, but there wasn't enough room with the whole state of Quakers and Mennonites, and plus the French making the Native American turn on the settlers. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Then in Salem, every political issue was brought to them, because the tavern was on a main highway going from Savannah to the rest of the country, from the revolutionary world to the Civil War. Generals and politicians and slave owners and slaves all came through there. So even if they wanted to free all their slaves, they couldn't. Plus, their land was almost taken from them a couple of times for not appearing American enough. But they don't get a pass or anything because they were still whipping slaves and selling them and judging them. Mm -hmm, but at least you get to see the whole picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, see, that's all that higher intelligence is about. 
So Mr. Williams, what was all the fuss over jeans? I'm sorry, what? Well, people were always trying to say something about jeans being different. Philosophers like Voltaire and Kant justifying their lives by dehumanizing others. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, see? That's man trying to figure out how things just work in the world. But aren't they supposed to be the super intelligent ones? I mean, priests, PhDs, physicians, lawyers, business leaders, politicians. Flat world, fairies, dragons, races. races. <laughs> religion, politics. We trust them to get it right. But how did they get it so wrong? I don't know, Sarah. I mean, we trust all these people around the table and it usually just favors the ones in the room. When somebody dies or gets locked away, Silenced. <laughs> Blessed quietness. What was that, Mr. Williams? Oh, it's nothing. My grandmother used to sing this song. Blessed quietness. I used said silence, and I remember that this song is what she raised me on. She would tell us to sit down somewhere and be quiet and let the Lord is talking. <laughs> did it work? Yeah, it seemed to. At least it did for how she raised us on what seemed like nothing. I wish it would work for the people sitting around the tables making decisions. Hmm. Too many voices, too many egos, too many lords. Blessed quietness, holy quietness, what assurance in my soul on a stormy sea, Jesus speaks to me. And the billows. The Moravian Brethren believed that Christianity should be a religion of the heart. The Moravians had already debated the question of slave owning in the church community of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. At a congregation council meeting in November 1742, it was suggested that if hired hands were necessary, rather than hiring insolently behaving whites, it would be preferable to buy Negroes from St. Thomas. The slaves would be treated as regular servants who would receive wages to show even those who opposed slavery how one could treat even Negroes. Bethlehem's Congregation Council took no action but commended the suggestion to the Brethren for further consideration. At the same Congregation Council, it was also suggested, we would always simply deceive ourselves should we have dealings with such people, slaves, with the laudable intention of converting them. No one becomes converted in a state of servitude. Such folks seek their own advantage and harbor false designs. But settling in a slave state would take challenges unforeseen. The Cherokee accepted the teaching for their children, but rejected the religion. The African Americans erected their first church in short order, beginning the work in September 1823 and having their first services in it by the year's end. The log structure was clapboarded in 1827. Whether the Negroes shall be taught reading and writing yet has not been decided. Some of Salem's residents obviously did not share the enthusiasm of the church boards and the female missionary society for the new mission. In spite of this, work on the church proceeded. It was consecrated 28 December 1823 with about 90 African Americans present along with the members of the Female Missionary Society and other supporters of the movement. Trombones played to announce the service. At a second service in the afternoon, Brother Emmanuel's wife, Sarah, was baptized. A third service, a love feast, was also held, at which a married couple were received as communicants. Creating a separate African-American congregation like most of the Moravians, dealings with slavery was full of contradictions. Concern for the spiritual welfare of the slaves was apparent, 
but so was a desire among some members for more separation of church as well as secular life. Part of the motive for preaching to the slaves was to make them obedient and well-behaved in a scriptural way, though that was also true for all members. Particular needs of the African Americans could receive more attention in a church of their own, but they were assigned white ministers and were discouraged from developing their own forms of religious expression. The Negro Peter Oliver was sent to Bethabara to work in Brother Christ's pottery with consent of the conference. On arriving in Wachovia, their newly purchased 100,000 acre tract of land on 17 November, 1753, they set about clearing fields and erecting buildings. In the mid 1700s though, the surrounding North Carolina colony was a vast underpopulated wilderness and the task of building communities proved greater than the Moravians could accomplish themselves. They turned to the expedient of renting slaves from neighbors in order to supplement their labor force. Brother Ernst visited us from Friedland. He took over from Brother Gottlob Kraus, the Negro Brother Peter Oliver, who has been employed by him for several years. The reason for this resuming ownership is that for some time, Oliver has not gotten along well with his master. The little Negro congregation here has been served uninterruptedly with the word and sacrament this year again. As far as circumstances permitted, the attempt was continued each Sunday to give the young people and children correct knowledge of spiritual truth. Brother Ernst had sold the Negro Peter Oliver to Gottlob Kraus, but at the request of Kraus took him back and wishes that he could hire him out in Salem. This Negro is working at present by the day for Brother Stoltz but it would be well for Brother Ernest to find a place for him outside the town as soon as possible. Unhappily, the court continued in session. A free Negro was tried for stealing Negroes, etc. There were a great many people there, and a large number of our brethren had to be present as jurymen. Therefore, the services were quite poorly attended on the brethren's side. Brother Stotes has sold the Negro Peter Oliver to Brother Christ in Bethabara. Brother Christ shall give bond for a certain sum, that if the Negro does not act according to the rules of the congregation, he will sell him. The execution took place of Charles, a Negro slave who had killed his owner. He died as a repentant sinner, and as we think we have reason to believe, a pardoned one. Though the roads and the weather were bad, a large crowd of people had gathered. Brother Wrights preached on Isaiah 29:15 on this dreadfully moving occasion. The single Negro brother, Peter Oliver, returned today from Pennsylvania. He spent the time in various congregations, but mostly in Lidditz. It has often been wished that a marriage proposal could be arranged for the Negro brother, Peter Oliver, who is now free. There seems no prospect for it here, and Brother Marshall has written to the brethren about it. The Negro brother Johann Samuel of Bethabara has been given his freedom by the General Assembly and may now rent a farm outside the town. His children were bound to Brother Marshall, who will ask the next court to bind them back to their father. The Negro brother Peter Oliver went to Nazareth on his own business. It has been proposed to Peter Oliver that he go to Pennsylvania and marry there, and then he could rent a farm there. January 2nd. Since approximately 100 Negroes had gathered for the service today and the church was nearly full of worshipers, one had joy in speaking and in urging the worshipers to let themselves be reconciled to God if they had not yet done so. These are the first fruits of our work among the Negroes here. For some time he had been instructed in Christian doctrine. The Negro brother Peter Oliver has returned from Pennsylvania where no suitable person could be found for his marriage. January 8th. Sunday. In the afternoon at one o'clock, there was a solemn service for the Negroes, attended by a considerable number of Negroes who were seated on the front benches, and also by so many members of this congregation, with some from Salem, that the building could not hold them all. In this service, there was the baptism of the Negro Jack, belonging to the estate of Brother Christian Conrad. The Negro, Brother Peter Oliver, was married to a mulatto by Brother Jacob Bonn as Justice of the Peace. She does not belong to us, but the marriage was approved by the church boards. He will build at a spring not far from our town. After singing the hymn in the English baptismal liturgy, Brother Eichel spoke in English on 
Then he made a short talk to the candidate, speaking in German, which the man understood better than English. Then Brother Eichel cut baptized him with the pouring of the water three times in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, giving him the name Yolan Emmanuel. Then several verses were sung, the congregation kneeling and the newly baptized prostrate upon his face. When all rose again, the newly baptized received the kiss of peace from our two Negro brethren who were communicants, who stood as his sponsors, namely Johann Samuel of Bethabara and Peter Oliver of Salem. Brother Rachel laid the blessing of the Lord upon him, which closed this solemn act, which had been performed in the felt presence of the Lord and had been accompanied by many tears of the candidate and the others present. In the afternoon at one o'clock, there was the funeral of the Negro brother, Peter Oliver, who fell asleep on the 28th. In addition to our members and visitors, a large number of Negroes attended and they were given the front benches. Brother Rachel spoke on the text for the day and led the liturgy on God's acre. The coffin was carried by Negroes. With the winds of change stirring, abolition talk in the air, 1822 seemed a long way from 1833. Freedom in the Caribbean. It must have been a joyous occasion on Sunday, the 23rd October, 1836, when the whole congregation had a love feast for those Negroes who in two days will embark for Africa in order to get their freedom there. 24 were leaving, including Saverick and 16 others who were freed by Dr. Henry Schumann feeling freedom breezes across the world. Half a year later though, on the 2nd February, 1840, a letter was read to the congregation from the Negro Savrick from Liberia to brother M. Schober here. It seems that the Negro brother Enoch Morgan Alexander and his wife, who emigrated from here last year, died soon after their arrival. Brother John Emanuel, one of the founding members of the African American congregation and its sexton for many years, has also died. 1845 seemed a long way from 1865. Work in the African-American congregation continued in a quiet way in Salem in the 1840s. Actual membership was small, only 13. But attendance at services was larger than that, as high as 100 at times, but falling to 20 or 30 when the Methodists were having a meeting nearby. Decisions of church leaders did not always encourage growth in the little Negro church, as they called it. But since no one can see the wind, just the effects of its work, the Moravian's mission work among the slaves in the West Indies was so successful, showing the white man that the Negro was capable of civilized living. It provided Wilberforce and the abolitionists with his most powerful argument to convince the English parliament that the Negroes were ready for emancipation. Likewise, those who toiled on US soil would not toil in vain. Sarah, praise God. Oh, the meeting went well. I did not as well as I had hoped, but it was enough. It was enough to ensure that those who repeatedly ignore the laws set down about the Negro will have their leases revoked. They shall be forced to leave Salem. Oh, this is good. I, I have seldom had this feeling of dreaming while being wide awake, and yet every time I've had it, it has proven to be true. What have you seen, darling? the most glorious news, praise God. And yet I, I don't know if this was a vision or a dream, but I saw that all of this nation's people will be free, enslaved to no man, just like in the Caribbean. All of our people and that little church will survive for generations. It will grow by the thousands. Just like us. What? Just like we will grow, Matthew, our little family. This is a glorious day. It's a glorious time. Wait. What is it, husband? My vision. Before there was rejoicing, there were dark clouds and they were red like blood. Could it have been the blood of Christ offering deliverance? It was the blood of our brothers, forced to choose sides. There will be much struggling in this community. How we think about these issues now will affect us again soon. 
In 1847, the Congregation Council abandoned all pretense and adopted Dr. Schumann's initial suggestion to abolish all restriction on holding slaves in town. Salem's brethren had, as some members pointed out in the last Congregation Council, council meeting, let themselves be guided merely by their own private interests. Show of hands? Therefore, the majority objects stubbornly to any regulation which would hamper his private interests. In this respect, Salem had become just another slaveholding southern town. Hear ye, hear ye. There she is. <laughs> now, I wasn't too clear on what this project was going to do for you, but I have never seen you so confident and strong. <laughs> Thank you, Daddy. <laughs> you did your thing, Miss Lady. Agreed. All that I imagined and then some. I'm so proud of you, baby girl. And when you said that anyone who has eyes to see or ears to hear, if you use this book to justify your notions of racial inequalities, hear this. Genesis did not say that Ham was cursed. It was his son and Noah's grandson, Canaan, that was cursed. And most, if not all of his descendants, died in the Old Testament. I didn't know what you all have been reading, but I could see as plain as day by tracing what happened to the people whose names belong to his descendant tribes. Oh, you got them, baby. <laughs> Some of our invited guests got a little uncomfortable. I thought they were going to click right off. Well, they'd be all right. Most of them are going to, they're here because of me and my invitations, and they'll be clicking right back on for my services at some point in time before the year's up. And, and then that money that I make them, they can watch my baby girl grow up before their eyes and know that they're going to have to come correct if she becomes a lawyer like me. Hmm. But, look at what, but look at what she just said. Work in the African-American congregation continued in a quiet way in Salem in 1840s. Actual membership was small, only 13 in the 1840s. But attendance at services was larger than that as high as 100 at times, but falling to 20 or 30 when the Methodists were having a meeting nearby. Mm -hmm. Decisions of church leaders did not always encourage growth. Yes. So why were you so set on keeping her in our curriculum from the certain topics like race and slavery? Because I live it every day, feel it. And people cannot shake the fact that this skin doesn't make me different than them. I mean, it's what's up here. Well said, brother-in-law. Hmm. So that's why you started a school? Yes, uh, because you know, I support schools every day that have to deal with institutional baggage from the past. And the funny thing is that it's still right here in the present, the same sentiments everywhere. I just wanted to see if we could start you know, with a fresh foundation, just shake off all of that and not have to deal with it. And what have we learned? That if every sector in, of us, in our society is tainted, then we have to begin to keep pushing uncomfortable but helpful dialogue in every sector. <laughs> so you know, the people who run from it, turn from it, cannot escape it. I mean, we deal with it now, so we can really change what the world got wrong so long ago. Yeah. Well, all right, there you have it. Chairman of the board has come full circle. Awesome. Finally. <laughs> yeah. We can't say that we are there yet if someone, anyone, is experiencing it. I'm saying my friends experience it every day, the same kind of sentiments that are reflected in the stories I read about from people who lived hundreds of years ago. Amen. It was a great report, baby girl. <laughs> yes. Your mother would have been so proud of you. Plus, representing North Carolina and Winston, acknowledging St. Philip's, one of the oldest black congregations in the United States and the only historic African-American Moravian congregations in this country. And that part about after emancipation, Reverend S.G. Clark, chaplain of the 10th Ohio Cavalry, spoke and told them that now they would have the greater responsibilities and encourage them to industry, honesty, and piety. Yeah, she was supposed to limit the time, but there was just so, was much. so much information. Yes. And the staff at Old Salem and Music Foundation were really helpful emailing me some of the links that I needed. I didn't know that their love for singing inspired John Wesley, 
who was then gathered the momentum to start this great journey and the good relationship between the two groups. And baby, you really tried to balance telling the stories about the struggles with slavery mm. until the wheels started coming off. You even tried to be nice to the North Carolina, bless its poor racist tainted soul. Mm. I know why your father didn't want us tang tangled with all of that bad history, but I had to let you try. I know you tried to stay net neutral and tell them the facts. Well, she did it from their own mouths, you know, blowing up myths and bad science and flawed theology. And you, you eliminated the New Testament. Wait, does that mean you're gonna have to, you're gonna look at your religion area now in school? I don't know. I just really wanna keep all my options open. Okay. I just know that options have expiration dates on availability of scholarships. Are you Mr. World Traveler? Really? <laughs> Worried about money for the school? No, but I'm just trying to turn, not trying to turn down anything that could be awarded either. If she would just choose some area, I could stir the pot. Sounds like you're better suited for some kind of hybrid course of study, not a specialized one. Wait, what's that? You may be stuck because you want to do something that allows the multi-talented and well-positioned to create their own degree based on multiple areas of interest. That sounds about right. I figure since all disciplines have been affected, maybe I could affect change in multiple areas. There goes law school. No, 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 not necessarily. She could still go to law school. She just has to plan well, you know, and be on top of her game in areas that could make any decision towards an advanced degree. Well said, doctor. <laughs> but remember, learning to focus in one area helps to give a person practice in sticking to something and getting good at it to a, a good enough to afford to affect change in multiple areas. Ah, oh, touche. Yeah. And with that said, I'm getting off this computer to start dinner, which will be ready in four to five minutes. Don't keep her too long. 45 minutes? What? I don't mess around. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I too should be going. Sarah, it was an absolute pleasure. Congratulations on everything. Oh, and, and thank you for not letting me fall flat on my face the first time out chairing the senior project committee. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Good night, Mr. Anderson. Uh, it's Andrew. Good night. Good night, Andrew. Nah, 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 nah. Too weird. <laughs> Good, <laughs> Good night, Mr. Anderson. All right. Good night. <laughs> well, okay, baby girl. I better let you go. I know it's been a long day. But before you go, do that last part for me. Huh? Come on. Daddy. Come on for me. While no institutions and organizations went unaffected by the sin of slavery, some valid attempts to stem the rising tide of human beings trying to be the richest and the wisest most truly believe the flawed narratives. When Noah awoke from his drunkenness and learned what his youngest son had done to him, he said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers, Shem's blessing and Noah's death. He also declared, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the servant of Shem. May God expand the territory of Japheth, but may he dwell in the tents of Shem and may Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. So Noah lived a total of 950 years, and then he died. He died, people. How long does it take for a curse from a man to die after he dies as a man will do? If it's forever, didn't this blood you helped colonize and sterilize the world with cover all Old Testament curses or just a few? Fortunately, the Moravians were one of few groups who worked with every other denomination and showed true examples of a religion of the heart. Despite the missteps, they quietly helped to inspire the Quakers, Mennonites, Episcopalians, Lutherans, and others, and especially helping to lead Methodist founder John Wesley to his destiny, which would ultimately lead to the denominations and its affiliated congregations, founding of 130 schools and universities 
80 being the education of the African American citizens, including Wiley College, mm -hmm. Claflin University, Dillard University, Bennett College, Houston Tillotson, Payne College, Rust College, Bethune Cookman, Mihari Medical College, Philander Smith College, Allen University, Edward Waters College, Morris Brown College, Paul Quinn College, Wilberforce University, Miles University, and Livingston, to name a few. The Moravians' impact on the world through missions and being true to yourselves and to your God inspiring. The thing is, they would be too modest to take all of this credit, but you just know you helped this one person search for Wachovia that has become a journey and that will last me a lifetime. Your one-time enterprise turned bank was there to help my mama and because of that, it led to my father finding her warm smile in the bank while he was in town working on assignment. Mm. You formed a family like you taught the Salem community and the world and I was born. I'm glad I made a choice to look into your hearts and to see what was there. Like all hearts, it is not perfect, but it beats circulating a will to help others in their search. The search for me was vast and wide, but here I stand because you stood and got knocked out a few times and got up again. I'm sure that all religions can say something close to the same. I just know what I found rekindling the memories of my mama and her Moravian influenced city. Dad, are you all right? Yeah, baby girl. Just fine. Go get your dinner before it gets cold. <laughs> Dad, that's what microwaves are for. <laughs> Can I just sit here with you for a minute? It can just be for a little while, if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, baby girl. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you. <laughs>